Welcome to Will's Personal Development Show. Today I have a very special guest that I am very excited to bring on. His name is Matthew Polly, and he wrote the new biography on Bruce Lee. Now I'm a huge, huge fan of um, just uh, Bruce Lee and um, I think this book just blew me away. Um, I went into it with expectations or assumptions about Bruce Lee and um, this book is just so detailed and really paints the you know the true picture and, and details of Bruce's life. Um, I thought um, he was so gracious to to come on as a guest, but more importantly, I think it's uh, uh, spectacular that um, you know we come to discuss this, especially uh, now when you know Crazy Rich Asians has just been released and there's all this talk about um, Asian representation. So Matthew, I, I'm so glad to have you. Thank you, Will, for having me on. It's an honor to be here. Awesome. So um, I just want to get started off the bat. How did you get so detailed with with this book? I know you did a lot of research. You probably interviewed a lot of people. How did that even come about? And was it was it tough? Yeah. So I uh, the first thing I did is I tried to read everything that had ever been written about Bruce uh, and to watch everything that Bruce had ever been in. Uh, and that took about two years because he there's a lot of books about Bruce Lee, wow. uh, not not many good books about Bruce Lee, but a lot of them. And then I spent uh, six months in Hong Kong interviewing people who knew him when he was a child and later in life who were colleagues of his and about six months in L.A. and Seattle where he lived in America. Uh, so I did over 100 interviews. And basically, um, I felt that previous Bruce Lee books had covered certain aspects of his life very well, but they, they had never covered the whole human being. Um, from birth to death, they tended to focus more on his time in America. And I really wanted to get a sense of who Bruce Lee was throughout his entire life in a really holistic way. Yeah, that was incredible. I, I was listening to another interview of you, and you said how you know Steve McQueen had so many biographies, but no one had really you know, honored Bruce and, and written a, a Thor biography about that. So, so I thank you for that. Um, uh, how, how hard was it to actually uh, get these interviews? Uh, were, were the everyone you reached out to willing to talk to you? Or was this something where you had to kind of pull teeth to, to get an interview? It depended. Um, some people were very excited. Uh, for example, uh, I was one of the first people to ever interview his uh, childhood classmates from LaSalle, and no one had ever thought to talk to them about who Bruce Lee was. Uh, and when they remember Bruce Lee, he was kind of a punkish kid uh, who got into a lot of trouble and stirred up fights. Uh, and so they had a very different image of him than what has you know, been part of the legend since he died. So they were happy to tell the story. And then there were some people, uh, for example, Chuck Norris uh, didn't want to do an interview with me, mostly because he's just tired of talking about Bruce Lee. Everywhere he goes, he gets asked about Bruce. Uh, so it ran the whole gamut. Uh, some people were easier than others. Um, but what I tried to do is talk to everybody so that um, people didn't want to be left out. Uh, so I would, when I, for example, was going to talk to Taki Kimura, I said, well, I've already talked to Linda Lee, Shannon Lee, Dan Inosanto, Bubba, Robert Lee, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, well, if you talk to all of them, then I want to talk to you too. So. That was my approach was to simply like Bruce did in fighting. I wanted to overwhelm my opponents. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, I also marveled at the, the amount of detail you had with the, the history of uh, certain uh, events at, as you painted them. You didn't just, you know, uh, base it off interviews. It seems like you did a lot of research into the history of certain events. I, I remember one that speak, speaks out is just all the... Um, um, events around, um, you know, how Chinese immigrants settled into the U.S. in the 1900s and so forth, and the the racism and ostracization and and all the stuff that that occurred during that time, um, and that was enlightening for for me as an Asian American millennial because I really didn't know any of this. I just kind of came into this world with assumptions. Could you talk about you know doing the research for that too? Yeah, I thought it was really important not just to write about Bruce Lee himself, but to set it in a historical context. I think previous books about Bruce treat him almost like a demigod, as if he sort of descended from heaven 
and just started kicking butt. Um, but he was a human being like the rest of us. And he grew up in a particular time and place and he faced uh, certain historical uh, problems and discriminations. And I really wanted to tell his story as sort of emblematic of the uh, the plight, the struggle, and the success of Chinese Americans, Chinese in America, um, starting with the 1850s when uh, the coolie trade was going on and the first Chinese came to America as mine workers. And then how after the gold ran dry, uh, they built the Pacific Railroad. Uh, and then initially they were welcomed as cheap labor, and then they were viewed as a threat in the same way sort of Mexican-Americans are now, uh, by other laborers. Uh, and then there was the Chinese Exclusion Act um, that was the first time any group had been excluded specifically because of their nation of origin and the programs against them uh, where there was the driving out. Um, even that history I didn't know until I started the research. And so I thought it was important to give a sense of what it was like and the level of discrimination Bruce faced when he was trying to make it in Hollywood. That's awesome. So you touch on a few points that I w want to dive into. Um, I think there's two big things that I really got out of the book, um, if anything else. Um, so the first would be that, you know, I went in with these assumptions, like you said, that, you know, Bruce Lee was very different from me. He was someone who had no fears. He was, you know, super confident and was just a winner from the moment he was born. Um, and obviously that that was shattered completely. He he was clearly a human with fears and 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 insecurities and, and flaws. Um, and then the second big thing I, I learned from this was just how, you know, how much of an impact he made and, and you know what he needed to do um, to to succeed and make that impact. So so I want to touch on the first one. I, I know it's probably like it's probably difficult to. Um, you know, paint a story of someone who is not perfect when you have to interview these guests. Uh, um, you probably at some point in the book realized that you can't, you know, you have to paint a realistic picture of Bruce. So how did you, how did you go about doing that without, you know, offending um, any of the people you interviewed who only want, you know, Bruce to be shown in a positive light? Yeah, that's one of the, um, it's one of the difficult things in writing a biography is that, um, my feeling is you owe your loyalty to the audience, to the readers. They're paying you the money, and your job is to give them the most honest story possible. But certainly some of the people I interviewed were worried um, that I might talk about some aspects of Bruce's life that they wanted to keep secret or wanted not to have anyone pay attention to. Um, and so I realized at a certain point that I just couldn't make everybody happy. And so I was going to have to write what I considered the most honest portrayal possible. But I, I think you touched on one really interesting thing about Bruce being human. Uh, one of the aspects of the story that when I was talking to Phoebe, his sister, and also reading some of the things that Robert, his little brother, said that gave me a clue to what he had to struggle with, his older brother, Peter, was the favored one. Um, and I think this is, I think all families have this, but particularly amongst the Asian families that I know, it, Peter was the studious, the scholarly, the introverted, the hardworking one. And Bruce was the screw up. He was the one who got into trouble in school. He was hyperactive. And his father was always punishing him because he couldn't act like his brother, Peter. And when I understood that sort of dynamic, then it gave me a real sense of who Bruce Lee was as a human being. He was somebody who was always sort of mad that his father favored his older brother, but always wanted his father's approval as well. And I thought that sort of captured an interesting psychological dynamic of who Bruce Lee was. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm so glad that you actually did uh, do it this way. I, that was one of the main draws that I, I loved about this book. I, I wanted the truth. I didn't just want, you know, um, the, the good sides. And it's, it really helped me relate to him and um, probably a lot of other people who read this book too. Um, I found myself, um, as, as many you know, young listeners to this podcast will probably do. I found myself relating to where he was um, at certain ages to where I was at that age. And um, you know, nowadays we we kind of beat ourselves up and say, oh, we're not successful at 20, or we're not as successful as we want to be at 25. 
and and Bruce was still you know he was this uh, you know dishwasher who, who dropped out of college with his wife and had a kid and struck really hustling to get by so that that really kind of helped me um, you know keep persevering yeah I think that's a great point I mean Bruce Lee was basically a failure until he was 31 <laughs> um, he uh, you know he had one bit of success when he was making the Green Hornet and then the job went away and at a certain point his wife had to get a job because he couldn't get any work he injured his back uh, he couldn't pay his mortgage he spent too much money. Um, he got into financial trouble. And so he he had all the experiences everyone has. I've spent too much money. I've had periods where I worried about whether I could pay my mortgage. Um, you know, a new kid comes along, you're worried about that. And so Bruce lived a very full life that was filled with success and failure. Yeah, so I, I actually um, wrote some notes down on what I think if I, I if I could distill his success principles down to a few you know traits, what would they be? And I would I, I'd love to list these to you and um, have your opinion. Feel free to delete from the list, add to the list, update the list. Sure. Um, but I said the first thing was luck. There's a lot of luck in terms of timing. So he introduced this new martial arts thing to a world which which wasn't. Uh, new to it and he had that film experience as a child thanks to his father um, partially and other than luck I said um, there is that charisma and salesmanship um, I think a huge one was also the, the the networking tactic he used where he he coached people in the Hollywood industry um, with martial arts or cha-cha which kind of got him noticed um, by the Hollywood industry through, you know, networking and connections. Um, I said, you know, the enthusiasm and passion that he had with, the, you know, what he loved to do. Um, and then I said, um, ego partially, there's pros and cons to his ego. Um, and then finally, his, his willingness to fail a lot, um, which he did, um, and not being scared of others' opinions while pursuing his goals. He made a lot of enemies. And finally, um, everyone likes philosophy and, and religion, so so to kind of add that in, he it kind of like took him to a higher level. Yeah, I think those are all spot on. I mean, I think you you picked up on the things. Uh, I thought networking was uh, someone Joe Lewis who said Bruce Lee could charm anyone, um, and I thought it was amazing that this you know Asian American who has this slight accent comes into Hollywood, he does one little TV show, and suddenly he's Steve McQueen's um, trainer. You know, that would be like being Tom Cruise's trainer now. Um, he, he was training the biggest box office star in the world, and he just had the kind of confidence to be able to network with those. I also think he was a really strategic thinker about his career. Um, he, he very much planned out, for example, when he went back to Hong Kong, and he took a job with Raymond Chow, he realized Raymond and Run Run Shaw were in a fight. Um, and so whenever he wanted something from Raymond Chow, he would go over to Run Run Shaw and threaten to leave. Um, and so he was good at playing the game. And I guess the final thing I would add to the secret to his success was he never quit. Um, the thing that amazed me about Bruce is I would have quit. You know, at a certain point, I would have, after all the rejection he took, I would have given up. And I think most of us would have or accepted something less. I would have played minor parts. But Bruce wanted to be a star. He only wanted to play leading roles and he refused to give up. And I think that's that's the key. Ultimately, is that he had the talent, he had the luck, he had the strategy, and then he refused to take no for an answer. That's very fascinating. Um yeah, and, and that point on um, on strategy, I think it's it's very interesting. I I have a friend who also read the book as well, and uh, he came away with it with sometimes different opinions uh, than I did. And and one thing he observed, um, he said that uh, there's uh, you know he he saw that Bruce did a lot of manipulation. Um, he said he saw there's a lot of moments where Bruce manipulated people. Um, for his personal gain, um, sometimes you know playing people off against each other, and 
I didn't really see that. I mean, I saw maybe I kind of interpret manipulating in a different way, but I, I'm I'm curious as to your opinions on that. Like, uh, did did you think Bruce, you know, manipulated people a lot? Uh, I think that Bruce was, I would say, strategic. When I think of the word manipulation, I feel like the implication is that he cheated somebody out of something. Um, like he he was using uh, Steve McQueen to advance his career, but he was also helping Steve McQueen become a better martial artist. And so he was very loyal to his friends. Uh, for example, um, I don't know if I put this in the book or not, but Jun Ri who was the father of Taekwondo, and he were very close friends, and Jun Ri invited him to a lot of his tournaments. Um, he helped Jun Ri get his own movie deal. So he helped Chuck Norris become a star. Um, he, he, he got Joe Lewis and Mike Stone work. And so he, he was very loyal to his friends. I think the only people he really played that he didn't like were his bosses. So he really just didn't like Raymond Chow because Raymond Chow had power over him. And in that case, yes, I, I think he did sort of manipulate Raymond Chow to get what he wanted. Um, but that's fairly typical for a star. <laughs> you know, he was Raymond Chow's biggest star. <laughs> when Raymond Chow said, I don't want you to make this movie, he, he threw a fuss until Raymond Chow let him make the movie. Most stars do that. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of like, you know, learning from Bruce's... Um, successful traits um that's something that um i think people will have a hang up on um because you know not everyone is that charismatic or you know has has this that swagger that bruce has and and it reminds me of a certain you know video clip he he had on the internet somewhere where he says like you shouldn't try and duplicate a successful personality i think I had the urge and others might as well to kind of like, you know, learn from him and duplicate him. But he, he himself says not to do that. Um, so if some, if you have any advice, you know, from your observations of Bruce, what, what advice would you have for someone who's trying to become successful, achieve whatever goals they're after? Um, would it be to like, you know, copy his charisma or, you know, the other traits that you, you can, but, or is it to just, you know, find your own personality and your own flow and, and, and go from there? I mean, Bruce was very specific, and you're right about that clip. He said a lot of people try to do Bruce Lee now, and no one can do it because there's only one Bruce Lee. And his point was, uh, I think what, was, what I tried to write about in the book was he wasn't Bruce Lee the way we think about him for a long time. Um, if you go back and you watch him in The Green Hornet— it's nothing like what you see in Enter the Dragon. He had to learn how to be this a tremendous star and charismatic star. And so I think the lesson from that is not that you want to you know, have Bruce's swagger. It's that you want to find something that you're that passionate about, which Bruce was about acting and martial arts. And then you want to be relentless in the pursuit of it. And that's uh, what I think was amazing about Bruce. Everybody who knew him talked about the fact that – he trained all the time. Like he was doing a 500 kicks even when his knees hurt. Um, he was constantly calling up his agents and various things to advance his career. Uh, and so I think if you are passionate about something and you work hard about it, at it, you will find your own expression. And you don't need to express it like Bruce Lee. Um, and if you did, you just look like you know an Elvis impersonator. It's silly. Uh, you want to you want to be your own thing. And Bruce Lee wanted people. In fact, when uh, he closed his Jeet Kune Do schools because he was afraid students would be copying his way of fighting. Um, so I think he wanted everybody to be their own. And a great example of that is uh, Jackie Chan. Uh, when Jackie Chan's career first started, they wanted him to be the next Bruce Lee. And so Jackie tried to imitate Bruce, and those movies were terrible. And then finally he realized if he did Jackie Chan, the funny guy, the clown, the comedian – Suddenly he was his own person and the movies worked. And I think Jackie's a great example of somebody who learned from Bruce's uh, how to be his own person through Bruce. Yeah, speaking of Jackie Chan and, and, and so forth, um, your last chapter in the book really details how much of an impact Bruce has had 
even though he's been gone for so long. And and now more than ever, I, I feel like there's a lot of um, voices in the uh, Asian community um, talking about um, you know, lack of masculine representation and so forth. And all, all sorts of theories about why this is. Some people say it's because, you know, um, it has to be a, an Asian-born Chinese person because if it's American-born, um, they won't have the confidence to succeed in Hollywood. Um, my question to you is, um, in terms of why Bruce has had such an impact, um, can you explain, can you decode it in any way? I feel like it's it's kind of hard to like um, explain because, you know, it's there's been such a long period since he's been gone and yet um, the people who have followed have really just been Jackie Chan and, and Jet Li and they, if anything, just kind of, uh, you know, followed in his footsteps in that martial arts world. And uh, right. until Crazy Rich Asian, which is like recently just came out, like there's really been no like masculine role of an Asian male that's not related to martial arts uh, in a Hollywood film? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and it's a tough one. Uh, Bruce Lee is important because he's the first Asian American to create a heroic stereotype for Asian men. Uh, before him, there was Fu Manchu-type characters, the villainous ones, and then there was the kind of uh, Charlie Chan, the model minority. And so when you watch, you know, for decades, I would watch TV shows and you would see if an Asian guy walks on, you're like, oh, he's the tech guy, <laughs> right? He's, he's, he's the guy, he's, he's going to be the smart nerd with the computers. He's not going to be the heroic cop who busts down doors and gets the babe and has a drinking problem, but redeems himself, right? He's not going to be a complicated character. Um, and I think Bruce Lee was the first time we saw a kind of heroic, swaggering, sexually attractive, incredibly strong, physically powerful um, Asian male character. And then after he died, and this is the tragedy of his early death, no one was there after him. And it took Jackie Chan 25 years before he finally starred in a Hollywood movie. Um, and so uh, I think it's terrible that Bruce did, couldn't live because I think he would have played a lot of different parts. I think he would have also done romantic and melodramatic leads. I think he would have been a great sort of sexy leading man as well as just a martial arts star. But because he only got to play martial arts stars, that became this pigeonhole. And every other Asian male who came afterwards had to play a martial arts star or they couldn't get a part. Uh, and I'm super happy Crazy Rich Asians is starting to break out um, and give, you know, Asian men different types of roles that they can be sexy leading men to, um, which they haven't been for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Same way for me. I, um, I, I noticed in the book that there was a lot of, um, you know, discrimination in terms of what Bruce had to overcome. And it, it's just very fascinating for me how he kind of went about it. Um, and, and sometimes it was, you know, he would stand up for himself. Um, it, it kind of reminds me of like Morgan Freeman. He, Morgan Freeman, when he started, he, he did similar things where he would walk away from a role if it represented his, his ethnicity the wrong way. And that's just something that's, that's quite fascinating to me when, um, you know, you're, you're already given so few opportunities. Is that really the best thing to do? Um, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how any any ethnicity, whether it's Asian or something else, can kind of overcome these these barriers to kind of su succeed in life. Um, and and with Bruce, I think um, you one big point that uh, you've mentioned in other interviews is he leaned in to what they discriminated against, whether he was in China or the US, whatever they discriminated against, you're not white enough, you're not Asian enough. He would kind of brag about it, I think, rather than hide away, which is kind of what I would do in that situation. Yeah, I think uh, his, his girlfriend before his wife in college, Amy Sambo, uh, has this quote that I thought was very powerful. And I, of course I put it in the book, which was, 
She said, at a time when so many Asian men were desperately trying to be white, Bruce Lee was so proud of being Chinese, he was bursting with it. Um, and she tells the story about how they got caught by this professor probably making out in his office. Uh, and the professor comes in and is like, who are you? And Bruce Lee charges up to him and he goes, I'm Bruce Sifu Lee, Kung Fu master, and starts describing what Taoism is in Kung Fu and writing it on the board. And so I think uh, one of the things that's really great about uh, Bruce Lee, even today, is that he gives an image of someone who really seized, um, if people thought being Chinese was a bad thing, he was there to tell you why it was great. And one of the reasons he wanted to teach Kung Fu to white people and black people and Hispanic people and not just other Asians is he wanted to show what was great about Chinese culture. Uh, and he was criticized for it. Um, his boss, Ruby Chow, said, you can't teach Kung Fu to black people. They'll use it to beat us up. And he said, oh, they can beat us up anyway, but at least now they'll know why our culture is great. Um, and so... I really feel that that's one of the things I like most about Bruce Lee after researching him is that he was so very proud of whatever it is they thought was bad. So even when he went back to Hong Kong, he's Eurasian. He's not fully Chinese. Um, there were people who were critical of him. And when he was in Hong Kong, he would emphasize he would wear sort of westernized clothing and he would play up that part of himself. And so I, I just admired the way, as you, as you said, he leaned into whatever people thought wasn't good. Yeah, that reminds me of that one part you mentioned in the book where, you know, out of the blue, he mentions to his little brother that, he, you know, he, he got he got circumcised in, in Hong Kong, which is ridiculous. I mean, ridiculously painful. So so it's it just kind of speaks to like how he's he kind of wants to be part of both uh, he's kind of like a mixture like a, a mixture a result of globalization in that way um yeah did, did you think you know do you think the circumcision came from his insecurity with you know not being american enough or do you think he never had any insecurities about it oh i think he had um i think what's interesting about bruce is that he was extremely confident but underneath the confidence, there were there were lots of insecurities. Um, and so, for example, um, one of the things that people talked about was when he first got to America, his English wasn't perfect. Um, and when he had trouble translating something in his head, he would stutter. And if anyone smiled, he'd get furious um, because he was really sensitive about his stutter. Uh, and even when he was acting, he was very sensitive about his English accent. Um, so I think Bruce Lee was um, extremely confident in many situations, but a lot of that was uh, masking some of the insecurities he felt. And, and I think the circumcision is a good example. He both wanted to be proud of who he was, but he also wanted to fit in. And so he always had that tension in his life where he wanted to be accepted as American when he was American, but he still was proud of being Chinese. Um, and when he was in Hong Kong, he wanted people to think of him as an, an American Chinese, not a Ch Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, and yet he would get upset when they said negative things about him in the press. So he was a complicated guy that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it's helped inspire me. Um, I, I think it's, it's great because I went into this book like uh, thinking that he's nothing like me. He, he probably never stuttered. He seemed so confident. Um, and I would stutter quite often. So to see that inspires me to to believe that it's it's possible. Maybe I can, you know, do something greater with my life too. Um, I want to move to his work ethic. So along those lines, um, I came into the book thinking that he had this super hard work ethic based off that one interview I saw of, um, well, a couple interviews of Chuck Norris who said like, Bruce had a very hard time turning off his engine and resting. Um, so I thought, you know, from the get go, he was this super hard workaholic. And nowadays, that's what you hear is necessary to succeed in life from from some entrepreneurs. They tell you you have to work uh, like crazy every day. And so um, when I read the book, I, I discovered that the first portion, at least the first half of his life, he didn't work hard because he wasn't into school and then even towards the middle of his life 
he would go to nightclubs and watch movies and hang out with his classmates afterwards and you know uh, wash his car so so at what point did the the switch actually flip because I know it, it did flip towards the end where he did turn into a workaholic um, so, so, do you know when that happened yeah I think uh, I think the big change occurred um, after he lost the part on the Green Hornet um, and he couldn't get work and his son was born and I think uh, the panic during that period when he had trouble supporting his family really drove him to become uh, a, a workaholic is the right term um, and he had trouble um, giving and that's about the time Chuck Norris met him uh, he had trouble resting or relaxing and he was constantly working out and doing things but you're quite right, and it's very interesting, uh, and it's good to be reminded, Bruce Lee was a terrible student. And, you know, if Bruce Lee had been a good student, he would have been like his brother. He would have been a scientist who worked at the Hong Kong Observatory, and no one would remember who he was. The fact that he was a bad student gave him space to take risks and do something crazy like try to be an actor in Hollywood. And I often think that one of the dangers... Uh, for my Chinese American and Asian American friends is they get pushed so hard so early to follow every step that they never get a chance to fail and try to find their own path. And I think uh, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee is like the bad kid who turned out to be amazing, right? Um, any, any uh, immigrant parent would have been totally frustrated with Bruce Lee as a kid. But because he was such a kind of screw up, that that gave him in a weird way a drive to try something different and something totally sort of risky, like trying to be an actor in Hollywood. That's quite profound, actually. the The whole idea that you know that m mistake or you know lack of success early in life led to much greater success later in life, which you know definitely I don't think many Asian Im immigrant parents. Um, truly forecast for they just kind of like aim for the highest probability risk averse situation um, right and that's that's really interesting because for my own life I think I've kind of done what I could to succeed in school and applied my willpower but it, it wasn't something that came natural and I, I did all right but um, you know maybe all right could have been a you know, bad thing in the long run, because who knows, maybe if I did worse, then I would have been free to, you know, pursue something more riskier. I don't know. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's one of those interesting, and that's where luck plays an interesting factor, right? I mean, uh, Bruce Lee was either going to be a successful star or he was going to be in prison. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and, uh, and so I think you, you put it right, which is um, immigrant parents are aiming for the highest probability of success. And that's why they're so tough on every level, right? But the danger is that you're preparing your children for middle management um, instead of preparing them to be CEOs or stars. Uh, and so I do think that one of the advantages Bruce had is that um, he had room to fail um, and his parents picked him back up and, you know, he flunked out of high school, you know. He couldn't even get through high school, and they sent him to America to work as a dishwasher to try to straighten him out. Um, so he was like the worst case scenario for any parent as a child, and look what he became. So there's hope for all of us. That's what I think, you know. And somehow or other, he found the ambition and drive later in life, um, and uh, he he worked himself, you know, nearly to death basically. So I want to talk about. Um... You know mistakes we can learn from from his life um, one thing I love about history and biographies is that you can kind of learn from what actually happened not what someone claims they did or you know their values but uh, what what history actually says and um, I have questions to you on to whether certain things are actually mistakes or really benefits um, so the first one as hinted at earlier was was ego um, you know he obviously had uh, difficulty when someone offended him, he, he wanted revenge, and he held grudges. 
Um, but also that ego kind of helped him fight for those leading roles that no one even imagined uh, they would give him. So, so do you think ego was had any downsides in his life? Yeah, I think ego made it, uh, a lot of his um, interpersonal relationships more difficult. Um, he lost some friends over ego. For example, uh, Jesse Glover um, and James DeMille were two of his early students, and they broke away to form their own school, and Bruce never really forgave them for that. Um, but as you point out, and this is one of the paradoxes of life, people's weaknesses are their strengths, and their strengths are their weaknesses. And you know, there were a lot of other very good um, Asian American actors at that time, guys like uh, Mako, uh, George Takai, who's still quite famous. Uh, but they accepted kind of lesser roles on TV, and they sort of got stuck playing those in like secondary, tertiary roles. And Bruce Lee, because he refused to take many of those parts, um, saved himself up to become a star. And so if Bruce Lee hadn't been as arrogant and egotistical as he was, he never would have made it. Um, that's just a fact. So um, the things that made sometimes his life difficult are also what helped him to succeed. Yeah, and that answers my next one, which was work ethic. Um, from my perspective, I thought, you know, work ethic is usually a good thing, but I also saw it as potentially contributing to his early death. Um, so yeah, I think it did. Yeah, when he died, his his mother said, uh, they asked his mother why, and she said overwork. Now, <clears throat> you can't actually die from overwork unless you're, you know, in a mine and they're not feeding you <laughs> or you're, you're on a slave gang. Um, he was an actor, so that's not how he died. But he made himself vulnerable and I think heat stroke is what killed him. And if he had only been able to take a vacation and gain a little weight back and get his health back after he first collapsed in May uh, before his death in July, um, I think he would have been able to survive the heat that he wasn't able to. Um, and that's, that's the sort of tragedy is that he worked himself so hard he made himself vulnerable and that's I think what ultimately killed him. Um, and he would have lived a longer life if he had been more relaxed, but he might not have been a star if he was the kind of the kind of personality who could relax probably wouldn't have succeeded. And, and that's the that's the strength is your weakness. You know, what made him great is also what killed him. Yeah, the, the last thing I have on here for potential mistakes in his life we could learn from would be um, affairs. Now. He did have a couple affairs um, based off your book and with other women during marriage. And, you know, technically it's, I mean, it didn't really affect his career success, um, but it maybe, I don't know, maybe it could have um, after it was found out. So, um, I mean, I don't know if it's truly a mistake, um, but, but that's, that's quite interesting. Um, do, do you, can you think of any other, uh, what, what do you think of, of, affairs as a mistake and, and uh uh do you think of any can you think of any other mistakes of his life because that's really all i could come up with uh yeah if my wife is listening affairs are definitely a mistake <laughs> <laughs> they're wrong and you shouldn't do it um i think what was interesting about bruce is he was he grew up in a time in which men sort of the double standard um they could do those things I think the mistake uh, Bruce made with affairs uh, was not, you know, he had a couple minor ones when he was in Hollywood. Uh, but when he got to Hong Kong, he was kind of drinking deep from the trough. You know what I mean? Like uh, he was using hash. He had more than just Betty Ting Pei. There were other sort of groupies on the side. And he was kind of doing all the things that celebrities do. And I think that was also part of what was stressing him out um, is that he was he was overindulging. Um, and so that, I think, was the mistake, um, the bigger mistake. I mean, obviously, I believe monogamy, but uh, the bigger mistake was um, he he overindulged. Basically, he 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 was having too many affairs in those last uh, years. And that also, I think, contributed indirectly to his death because 
it, it was he was stretching himself too thin. How did you go about uh, finding this stuff? Because it's, it's probably not something that you know it's easy to find when you do research about a biography. Uh, yeah, no, that's not, <laughs> you're like, who slept with Bruce Lee? Raise your hand. <laughs> um, uh, no, what you inevitably do is you just talk to enough people that someone says, uh, you should go talk to her. Um, and then you call her up and she's like, yes, I, I have a story for you. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, what's interesting is, uh, the, I often think that, uh, Bruce Lee should be a subject they teach in college, like Shakespeare because he's such an interesting guy. Um, but there's really been a lot of his fans are like the Bruce Lee scholars. And so if you go on certain websites where they, they talk about Bruce Lee obsessively, a lot of those guys know a lot about Bruce Lee. Um, and so I would talk to people who were experts who were like, yeah, you should interview that person. They've got a good story. Um, so that's kind of how you found out things like that. Awesome. Um, so one thing I, I marvel at about Bruce is um, his his dating history. I think, you know, even now, Asian men have a very hard time dating white women or, or women of other ethnicities um, in, in European countries. And, you know, it's, it's a mixture of probably many different factors, maybe latent racism and, you know, lack of confidence. But... Even back then, like 40, 50 years ago, um, from what I I discovered, I was amazed to find that Bruce, you know, he dated many white women. And, um, you know, when people would explicitly uh, harass him, I, I remember one point in a book where I, I believe it was three white men were, were calling him um, horrible names, racist names, and, and following him uh, with a white date, uh, you know, he he wanted to fight them and stand up for him. Um, but he didn't because the, the, the date convinced him otherwise. But um, I find that very fascinating. Um, can you talk a bit more about that? Like what, what do you think it was that kind of allowed him to do this um, in a time where it was even more racist? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to be on your podcast because I think this is an important part of the book, but it doesn't get picked up by um, a lot of white interviewers. Um, but Bruce Lee is also important uh, because he was an Asian guy who white women and black women and Hispanic women and Asian women thought was sexy um, from very early on. He had he dated the most beautiful women when he was in Hong Kong. When he got to America, he dated the most beautiful women of all races. His white his wife was white. Um, when he became, he was like a, a minor role in the movie Marlowe and he was having an affair with the lead actress who's ex Sharon Farrell, who's extremely beautiful. Um, and on the green Hornet, there was this statuesque blonde who wanted to be with him. So I thought it was very interesting that, um, Bruce didn't have any, uh, lack of confidence or lack of success in that area. And I think, uh, why he was able to do that is that he had um, a really strong hyper-masculinity. Um, even though he could be sensitive and funny and charming, he had a level of sort of violence and aggression um, that made him sexy in a way. Um, and he still does. I remember I was showing, my wife had never seen Enter the Dragon or any Bruce Lee movie, and I was playing the movie, and at a certain point she's like, hmm, Ah, <laughs> I'm like, do I have to turn this off? And she's like, he's sexy. And I'm like, all right, enough. Um, but there was, there's just something about Bruce Lee. Uh, you know, he was a good looking guy, but that I, it was more than that. And I think he just carried himself. He had that kind of cocky confidence um, that's not associated with Asian, Asian American men. Um, you see it more in Asian men. And I think that that uh, was part of his appeal. Um, and again, what, uh, his Japanese American girlfriend said that he didn't, he didn't walk like other Asian men. He didn't carry himself. He had this, uh, confidence. And I also, I do think that his ethnic pride, um, was useful, um, in attracting other people. He didn't try to hide who he was and he didn't try to pretend he wasn't Chinese. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so tell me a bit about your story with Bruce Lee. Um, I heard that you, you kind of grew up watching his, his films and, and that kind of inspired you. Yeah, I was like the skinny bully 12 year old when I first saw Enter the Dragon. And uh, I think Bruce Lee appeals to a lot of young guys like me. Uh, at that time, I was scared. I was kind of frightened. The girls didn't like me. Um, I wasn't cool. I was nerd. Um, and I was really good at school. And I, the teachers loved me, but all the kids thought I was a dork. Uh, and so I wanted to be cool like Bruce Lee. I wanted to have his swagger. I wanted to be as tough as he was. I wanted to have his muscles. I wanted to, the girls to think I was as sexy as they thought Bruce Lee was. Um, and so that whole package, I think, uh, was very appealing. Um, and I ended up taking the martial arts, even though I grew up in like Topeka, Kansas in the uh, late 80s. And there weren't many martial arts schools, but I wanted to be um, a martial arts badass like Bruce Lee. Uh, and so I was one of the millions and millions of uh, young men across the world who who were inspired by Bruce Lee to become a, uh, a martial artist. That's awesome. Yeah, it reminds me of like some of the new documentaries that came out about him with all these different celebrities that, that have been inspired by him, including Kobe Bryant and Mike Tyson. And it, it makes me wonder why why and how did, they, did he have such an impact on so many different cultures? And um, I'll give you my short hypothesis um, and feel sure. free to kind of update it. Um, I think it... I would point to that one paragraph you had in the last chapter of your book where um, that one uh, city in in uh, in Europe somewhere, they, mm -hmm. they couldn't, they were debating which statue to put um, up in Bosnia. And they were debating between Gandhi and the Pope. And, and the only man that um, both sides of the Catholics and the Muslims could, could um, agree upon for, you know, a symbol of... Uh, racial equality and justice um, was was Bruce Lee. Um, do you think that's it? Because I think it's even more than that. There's also that philosophical aspect to him. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I, I'm glad you pointed out that part of the book. Um, I ended the book with that because I think that's such a profound message that Bruce Lee has come to symbolize uh, almost a post-racial world where we recognize our differences, but um, Bruce was somebody who, you know, he was asked, do you think of yourself as Chinese or American? And he said, I like to think of myself as a human being because under heaven, we're all of one family. And I think that's a powerful message as well. So as proud as he was of being Chinese, he always wanted to be remembered as a human first. Uh, I think it's the whole package. Um, and you point out his philosophical side, which I haven't talked about as much this interview, but he really did have a kind of um, spiritual yearning, and he was a he was a very sort of he was a seeker. He was looking for answers, and I think that's powerful. And also that he could kick ass, and nobody ever looked as cool on screen um, doing martial arts as Bruce Lee. Uh, and that he was sexy, and that he was pretty smart, um, and he was ambitious and driven. And I think all of those things work together. Uh, and then finally. I think it was really powerful because he represented the first time an, an East Asian uh, male uh, showed that heroic, powerful side. Uh, and so, for example, the black community really latched on to him. Uh, you know, all the, you know, the Wu-Tang guys loved Bruce Lee and watched his movies and watched all the Kung Fu movies. And so he really introduced a whole aspect to um, African-American culture that didn't exist before. Uh, and then, of course, white guys like me love Bruce Lee um, because we thought we could be great martial artists like him. And we didn't think of him. He was almost like uh, Michael Jordan. He was almost beyond race. We didn't I didn't think of him as particularly Chinese until I was older and understood those differences. Uh, and then, of course, he has an interesting relationship with the um, Asian-American community where many of them, many of y'all admire him. And then there's some sort of ironic distance where, for example, there's that podcast, they call us Bruce, um, where there's a certain resentment that there, that Bruce Lee is the only masculine idol 
as an Asian American and that there hasn't been more since him, which isn't Bruce's fault, but I can understand the criticism. So, um, yeah, he had a really interesting impact on all these different um, ethnic groups across the world and in America. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing people are always kind of interested in and searching about is um, Bruce's diet and, and workout routine. And, and I kind of wanted to, um, you know, get your thoughts on this, maybe stuff that you didn't cover in the book. Um, right. From what I could tell, he, his diet seemed to be like a, a lot of spaghetti from Linda's cooking and, um, you know, just uh, sometimes unhealthy, but, you know, common foods from a Chinese restaurant like right. pig and duck and then the, the latest fad supplements and, and vitamins. Is that, a, is that about accurate? Oh, and weed. Yeah, and weed. He did like to eat hash, which <laughs> I don't recommend. Um, but for Bruce, it helped calm him down. Um, yeah, he, he, what was interesting about Bruce is everyone said that he couldn't, uh, he could eat all he wanted and he couldn't gain weight. Um, and it was like, you know, his nickname was the little dragon, um, Lee Shaolong. Uh, and it was like there was a furnace burning inside of him that he just fed whatever. Um, and I don't think what I, what he did for a diet, I wouldn't recommend to anyone. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, that he was experimenting with protein shakes um, long before anybody else did. And so um, he w he definitely was somebody who who was um, experimental and cutting edge as far as dietary stuff. I'm not sure much of that held up, though, um, particularly he would ground up, you know, he would ground up beef. <laughs> and then drink the milk the cow's blood which was which is not a good idea so yeah what what about his uh workout routine um do you have any like uh info on like how he uh, worked out from what i heard there's um some people say he did you know higher reps and others say he, he was one of the first to do like a a crossfit style routine where it was more about you know strength training and, and repetitions and, and a set amount of time. Yeah, I think that's where he was. Uh, he was way ahead of his time, and the way he trained is the way a modern sort of mixed martial artist train. Uh, so he quickly realized uh, after his fight with Wong Jack Man, where he ended up feeling exhausted, even though he won, it was only a three minute fight. He realized he wasn't, you know, ba Bruce's body was basically one fast twitch muscle. He, he lacked cardio. Um, and so he picked up road work from boxers, uh, and he did it in the morning, which is the way you're supposed to. So he would get up in the morning and do a three to five mile run, <clears throat> and then he would rest and eat breakfast. And then he would do his martial arts routines in the morning. So he would do a couple hours. Uh, and then in the afternoon, he might do another hour and then at evening do another hour. So Bruce Lee was, he was training about four hours a day. Which, to be honest, if if you have another job like being an actor or something, is the most you should train. Um, and to, it's not sustainable to train more than four hours a day as an athlete. Uh, and and he and you're quite right. Um, he read all the muscle and fitness magazines of that era, but he never wanted to have bulky muscles. And so he did a lot of high rep, low weight, um, and he cross fit and cross trained. Um, he wanted power. In his attacks, he didn't want bulkiness and strength, uh, so he was looking for speed um, because you know it's, you know it's mass times velocity squared is power. Velocity is more important than mass, um, and that's something that he recognized as a martial artist and an athlete. And very interestingly, um, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was one of his students, and he helped Kareem with his weightlifting regime. So you know, he was helping professional athletes at that time, get into weightlifting, which none of them did back in the 1960s. They all thought weightlifting was bad for you. Yeah, when, so when you brought up Kareem, that just made me uh, think about how he was also a pioneer in terms of collaborating with, you know, influencers before that was really even a thing with social media. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, to have someone like, you know, this NBA star who is a different ethnicity come on this epic you know martial arts film i just think is incredible um 
um, what do you think it was that allowed him to kind of like break down those barriers and and talk to all these different races and, and go to those places? Because you you mentioned in a book how he would go to a cowboy honky tonk, he would go to all these different places that most Asians would would stay away from, and even if they did go, they would be you know ostracized there. Yeah, no, I just I do think that that's something special to him. Um, I, I just love the use of the phrase influencers, um, because you're right. I hadn't thought about it, um, that way and kind of social media terms, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the most famous uh, college athlete in the country. And he wanted to learn a little bit about the martial arts and someone recommended him to Bruce and they became best friends. And, and when Bruce saw him, he thought to himself, I got to get this guy in a movie. Because me fighting a seven foot four black guy, Chinese audiences have never seen anything like that. They'll freak out. And of course, he he eventually did. He got him in the game of death. It's a great sequence. It's one of the most amazing things you've ever seen on film. And so he had a vision, uh, which was also special. uh, As soon as he saw Kareem, he thought, how could I figure out a way to help him? you know, help him, but also help him help me and my career. Um, and so he put him in a movie and it, it helped launch Kareem Abdul's movie career as well. Um, so, uh, I don't, I, I, that, I don't know how he did it. He just, he just had real vision and, uh, and incredible sort of, and to use a Yiddish term, chutzpah, like, you know, I like the stories too, where he walked into like an all black pool hall and people, gave him shit and he started to fight and he kicked people's asses like he just wasn't afraid in those situations and that's why i think that um he was able to go places other people couldn't and i also think that's why people uh liked him is because they knew if he was friends with you it he was a true friend um because he wasn't you know he wasn't a scared guy trying to you know latch on to people he was a cocky confident guy wow uh, so a lot of people want to find their passion. A lot of listeners are, you know, young and lost in life, or they they believe they are. Yeah. And, um, you know, with with Bruce, it seemed like he just kind of drilled down and focused on, you know, cha cha and and kung fu, and and just made that the center of his life and did everything through those dating, social life, career, and so forth. Um, whereas other people, they seem to have tons of passions and they can't decide and they think they're falling behind in life. Do you, do you have any, you know, advice or um, observations f- from your research on on finding that passion? Well, I, uh, I think from my experience and watching my friends who are a little older than yours probably, uh, is that um, over time life sort of tells you which one of your passions are, uh, you can make money at. Um, and that's one of the... the the tough things about life, but also one of the things that makes you wiser as a human being. Um, but I do think that it's important to narrow your focus down as you get into your twenties on something that you're willing to sort of die for. Um, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor, those are pretty traditional paths, but if you're going to try something in the arts or something more entrepreneurial that involves more risk, um, I think you really need to, narrow your focus and, and, and really only have a couple of them, um, because it's so hard to be great at any one thing. Um, and so for me, uh, while I love martial arts, I ended up really focusing on writing, uh, and sacrificing a lot of things to get to this point where I could talk to you. Um, and it wasn't an easy path. And that's one of the things I sympathized with Bruce. It wasn't an easy path for him, too. And I think for anyone who takes an untraditional path, uh, it requires uh, a kind of singularity of focus. All right. So finally, last question. Um, you know, if, if the listeners of this podcast, they forget everything else that was said here and you could only impart one thought or idea or message to them, um, What's, what's your last parting thoughts? I think the moral of Bruce's story uh, is that the impossible is possible if you're willing to pay the ultimate price. Uh, and Bruce wanted to be the first Asian 
international movie star, and he became it, but it cost him his life, and he was willing to pay that price to have that success, and that's why he succeeded. Wow. Wow, that's deep. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Mr. Bali, for uh, being on this show. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I really love the book. I'm going to recommend it to everyone. It's a great book. You guys should check it out. Um, thanks again for, for coming on. It was an honor to be on, Will. And, it, and, and I also want to just say it's a real pleasure. You asked some great questions. And so I was totally delighted when you invited me. And I'm, I'm very glad that we got to talk. Thank you. See you guys. Take care.